Good morning. My name is Holly Howes, and today we are going to be reading from 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 through 20. That's 2 Corinthians 5. And if you're in the Blue Bible, it is page 1,797. 2 Corinthians 5, 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us and the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Well, good morning, church. Uh, as you may uh, begin to realize here this morning, this is our final sermon in our series on our mission, vision, core values, and discipleship pathway. And so just a little teaser for next week, we are looking forward to beginning a series on the Gospel of Luke. And you can begin praying about that, perhaps even reading some portions of Luke as we uh, look forward to starting that next week. Last Sunday, we talked about personal global evangelism. And this morning, we want to wrap up our series by talking about personal local evangelism. Both of these come right out of our core value of evangelizing the lost. And they're directly connected to our vision that we will be a church who personally shares the gospel locally and globally. Now, even though I'm a pastor, um, I feel like I need to just admit to you that I've never felt like I'm a very great evangelist. Never felt like evangelism has really come to me real naturally or really been a strength. And in fact, um, to be transparent with you, uh, evangelism intimidates me a bit, uh, sometimes more than a bit. I find myself more comfortable and more inclined to preach to and teach to people who are already saved, those who know Christ. I love building people up in their faith, and so I enjoy that part of my role as a pastor. Even so, I feel prompted by God's Word, and I feel compelled by His Spirit to share the good news when I meet someone who does not yet know Christ. And it is a privilege and a joy to do that, even if it doesn't feel like a strength. As we noted last week, uh, we don't want to miss out on God's missionary heart. And part of that heart for the lost would include the lost right here in our own hometown of Bemidji. Second Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That is God's heart. That is God's desire and we want our hearts to be like his heart. So today we're going to focus on personal, local evangelism. And as we do, we're asking God to infuse us with a, a greater passion, a greater courage, and even confidence, a greater burden for the spiritually lost in our own backyard. The fourth G in our discipleship pathway is go. And we want to think about going locally with the gospel. Before we go any further, would you please pray with me? Well, Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be gathered here as a church and worshiping and fellowshipping together. And we just pray that you would help us to examine our outreach, our local evangelism uh, as a church and as individuals. Guide us in your word. Help us to rightly apply it that we might live it out for your purposes and your glory. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. 
Personal local evangelism means that each Christ follower should be involved in local evangelism. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19 says that God reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. That message is this, that through Christ's life, death, and resurrection, each person on the planet is offered the opportunity to not have their sins count against them. By grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, our sins can be added to Christ's account. They can be put on his tab, as it were. And as those who ourselves have been reconciled to God, we are now urged to reconcile others, to urge them toward reconciliation with the living God. 2 Corinthians 5.20 states it plainly, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. But what does it mean exactly for us to be ambassadors for Christ in Bemidji? The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines it this way, an ambassador is an authorized representative or messenger, especially a diplomatic agent to a foreign government as the resident representative for a special and often temporary assignment. Now that's a mouthful. <laughs> Kind of a long definition. But there's a clear connection to verse 20. Each and every Christ follower is his authorized representative. And we alluded to this some last week when we looked at Matthew 28 and we talked about how Jesus has sent us out under his authority. He has authorized us to go out with the gospel to make disciples. And not only do we act on his authority, but we deliver his message. We go as messengers of the gospel. Now, this mention here of a foreign government might make it sound like we're returning back to our global focus from last week. However, the point of an ambassador isn't just that he or she goes to a foreign place, but that they are from a foreign place, or at least they represent a foreign place. Philippians 3.20 says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, even though we haven't actually been to heaven yet, we are representatives of heaven's King. Once we become Christ's ambassadors, we no longer consider this world our home. We're just passing through. We're on our way to a much better place, better in every way, including the lasting permanence of being eternal residents of heaven. In other words, if you think about it, we are the foreigners. We are foreigners here, and we're acting as resident representatives for a limited time only. We're on special assignment until the Lord brings us home. Our mindset here on earth should really be more like a camping trip than establishing a long-term homestead. It should be more like renting. We're just renting for a while, and when you're renting a place, it's best not to get too attached to that place because the very nature of a rental is it's meant to be not so much of a long-term thing, not so much of a permanent arrangement as temporary. So as ambassadors, our temporary assignment is personal evangelism, and we want to think about how that's done locally. 
Personal local evangelism means that each Christ follower should be involved in evangelism locally. Last week we discussed globally. Today we want to focus on locally. So we're talking about evangelizing people who are right here, right in our midst, our immediate vicinity, our neighbors, our classmates, people we work with, people who we bump into as we make our way through town because this is where we live. And our commission is to actively spread the good news about Jesus to the people right around us. So this means that we make intentional efforts, build relationships with people beyond our circle of friends here at the church, relationships with people outside these walls. One of the ways that I remind myself of this call to local evangelism is with a wooden cutout map that I normally keep in my office. I actually have it down here on the communion table this morning. If you'd like to look at it after the service, there's a picture of it here on the screen as well. It's a gift that my wife, Debbie, gave me. She gave it to me as an encouragement and kind of spurring me on and reminding me as a pastor of my local mission field. In the words of Acts 1.8, it's a great way to visualize our Jerusalem. From time to time, I actually look at any number of maps. Sometimes it's just a road map. Sometimes it is one of these uh, geographical plat drawings or plat books. Sometimes I'll look at a county map, much like the one up here on the screen on the right side there. It helps me visualize and prayerfully think through not just our Jerusalem, but our Judea and our Samaria, our local area to which we are to bring the gospel. I'd like to ask you a question. Do you think that our church should be more like a free clinic where people with spiritual health needs can come in and get the services they need? Or should our church really be more of a training center for spiritual EMTs who are built up and trained up so they can go out into the community and give spiritual care to those in need? Well, ideally, I suppose our church really should be both, shouldn't we? Have aspects that meet both of those needs. In other words, some of our church's outreach is composed of simply being here, having a building, having a place, providing services for people where they can come into the church and be loved and encouraged and have their questions answered and their needs met. But there should also be a component in which we actively and intentionally go forth out into our community to reach those who, for whatever reason, may never come to this building. For whatever reason, they may never walk through these doors. In Mark 2, 16 and 17, it says, When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked the disciples, Why? Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have, come, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. That's why Jesus came. And these words of Jesus here illustrate really a pattern throughout his earthly ministry. Jesus spent a lot of time with unsaved people. He took advantage of these opportunities to minister to them and to teach them. He was intentional about being out among everyday people who were spiritually lost. He didn't limit himself to just teaching people in the temple. And that's instructive for us as a church today and as individual believers today. That is instructive for us. Are we getting the message of the good news about Jesus out to the spiritually sick? 
Are we getting the spiritual care, the doctoring that's needed to heal their sin? In terms of personal local evangelism, let's put it this way. We should not spend all of our time with people who are already saved. Jesus spent a lot of his private time teaching and training his closest disciples. But he also spent a lot of his time traveling around in the public, teaching and evangelizing the masses. So if you and I don't have very many non-Christian friends, then one of the most God-honoring ways that we could respond to today's message is to make some is to prayerfully consider how we could spend more of our time with those who are lost. There's a classic book on evangelism called Out of the Salt Shaker. It's a great title because you almost immediately know what it's going to talk about. Its basic premise is that Christians can't have an impact on this world unless they get out of the church. We can't spend all of our time in the salt shaker, friends. We need to be shaken out in order to get out in the proximity of those who need the salt, who need the impact of the church. This is directly related to denying ourselves, taking up our cross and following Jesus. We choose to die to ourselves die to that which might be most comfortable and convenient for us. We choose to do that which is inconvenient and sometimes uncomfortable for the sake of the gospel. So let's be willing to wade through some of the awkwardness, some of the discomfort that comes when we spend time with people who believe differently and behave differently than we might be comfortable with or choose to do ourselves. Paul explains it this way in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23. Though I am free, belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. And in this verse here, Paul makes it clear that we shouldn't morally compromise ourselves or rationalize sinfulness in some way as a ploy to be more effective in our evangelism. He's clarifying that's not, you don't go that far. (laughs) We should continue embracing holiness even as we spend time with and go out to be with unholy people. Verses 22 and 23 conclude, To the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. And I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. So in terms of personal, local evangelism, we could put it this way. To those in Bemidji, I became like one in Bemidji. Even as we talk about some of these inconveniences and these challenges of spending time with the spiritually lost in our own community, this is still our community. It's where we live. Quite the opposite of global evangelism that we talked about last week, local evangelism enjoys the familiarity of our local surroundings. Which is interesting to think about because we just talked about being ambassadors who are representing a foreign place. And yet, here we are, we're locals. 
ambassadors who are locals, and you've got to kind of put those two ideas together a little bit. In fact, we should delight in the fact that we are the people who are best suited to share the gospel in Bemidji, much more than anyone who's coming from the outside. And it doesn't mean that local evangelism won't have its challenges. It certainly will. But the typical challenges of a global evangelism, like learning a foreign language or learning a foreign culture, they're pretty much non-factors for us. I can see that clearly as I look out and see all the flannel in the crowd. We're in Bemidji. I would be wearing flannel myself, except some people like me to wear this suit, but I'd much rather have my quilted flannel on right now. Up here in lumberjack country, you and I are the experts at reaching our fellow lumberjacks. These are our people. This is who we are. Why? Because we're locals. Don't hassle us. We're local. No one else on the planet is as uniquely suited for gospel ministry to the Bemidji area than those who live in the Bemidji area. Those who make their living here, those who participate in community events, those who raise families here, those who hunt and fish, those who enjoy life up here in the beautiful North Woods, those who know about 40 below zero and say, not a problem. We can do that. You and I know the local language. We know the culture. We understand the apologetic concerns. We know of the false teachings that have come through this area. Anything and everything that a global missionary would study and prepare for in order to come into Bemidji, we already know it. And, and I don't mean to be bragging about that, but we do. Local evangelism is included in God's heartbeat for this lost and fallen world. So we dare not adopt an aloof or an indifferent attitude toward local evangelism. We dare not allow our church to wane in its commitment to reaching our community. Those of us who are becoming deeply devoted followers of Jesus together, we need to develop a local vision for the gospel. Personal local evangelism means that each Christ follower should be personally involved in local evangelism. One of the best ways to be personally involved is to be personally involved with the ministries of our local church. And to ensure that each of the ministries of our local church has a community outreach component. Our church's core value of evangelizing the lost should guide each of our ministries in our church to keep outreach at the forefront of our planning. In fact, for the past year or so, our elders have been talking about this. We've been praying about this, studying and strategizing how to increase our church's evangelistic effectiveness. And we've been preparing to launch some strategies which we hope will help our church be more effective at reaching the lost right here in our neighborhood, in our own community. Now, apart from the official ministries of the local church, there are also many ways that each of us can be involved in local evangelism. For me, this brings to mind the godly example of Don and Mabel Emery. Some of you probably remember the Emerys, many of us, they are now with the Lord. But they were both actively involved in our church for many years. And together they in, illustrate a wonderful example of active intentionality in personal local evangelism. Over the span of some 35 years, they invited countless people over to lunch. In fact, I'm guessing a number of us in this room 
have had lunch at the Emory's. Many of their lunch guests were believers, but many were not. A good number of them were students from Bemidji State University who came to Bemidji from overseas, and they hadn't had much opportunity to hear the gospel, to learn about Jesus and the good news of salvation. You see, Don and Mabel actually had some connections at the university, and they would hear about who some of the new students were on campus, and then they would make intentional efforts to go and invite them to come and have lunch with them. And they weren't what some people might consider preachy when they had people over. They were simply kind. They were hospitable. And they represented Christ well. Now, they did pray before the meal, and they did invite people to Christian events, but mostly what they did was love people and eat with them and apparently play, I think that's Uno, <laughs> play Uno with them or games with them. Showed God's love through kindness and hospitality. And in terms of today's message, they developed a culturally strategic and effective way to share the good news with people in Bemidji. With this in mind, let's consider some specific ways to get involved with personal local evangelism. First thing we can do is invite someone to lunch, particularly someone who doesn't know Jesus. In the words of Mark 2.16, Eat with some tax collectors and sinners. And if we here at the church see a fellow believer who's eating with a sinner, I hope we'll pray for them and be excited for the outreach opportunity that's there. Second thing we can do is prayerfully consider our everyday local evangelism opportunities. This includes everything from where we work, where we go to school, our community events, our hobbies. Each and every one of these can be a gospel opportunity with a little strategy and a lot of prayer. Be intentional with the many people who are already naturally around you because you're local and you live here. People who don't know Jesus, but they know you. And you could be the one to tell them about Jesus. You could be the bridge. You could be the connection between them and God as you introduce them to the truth. Thirdly, you can invite someone to our church's outreach events. Ideally, all of our events have some sort of an outreach component, but some are, are more obvious than others. And to be clear, don't just attend by yourself or don't just attend with your church friends, but maximize our outreach by bringing someone with you to the men's breakfast, someone with you to the women's tea, or to any number of other events and opportunities we have throughout the year. Fourth thing is be creative. Be creative in your own personal local evangelism. After all, you are the resident expert of Bemidji. You know. You know how to dress. You know what things are like around here. You know the language. You know the history of this area. You know the demographics, the lay of the land. That is your forte. So use these as a gospel advantage and come up with a strategy to do personal local evangelism. The fact is, you really don't need me to suggest a bunch of ideas. More than likely, your ideas will be better than mine because your ideas will be fitted to who you are and where your, your niche is, your relationships are. You know the ins and outs of your day and your week. So better for you to come up creatively with your own strategy as God would lead you. Anyone who considers themselves a deeply devoted follower of Jesus should seriously and prayerfully consider how God is calling them to local evangelism. 
And let's keep in mind Jesus' encouraging words from last week out of Matthew 28, where we go under his authority. And that he is with us. Surely he is with us to the very end of the age, to the very ends of the earth, even so far as Bemidji. He is with us. So let's remain vigilant in prayerful dependence as we go forth, empowered by the Spirit, to share the good news about Jesus. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have been given a great commission mandate. And we've been sent out to an exotic and faraway place called Bemidji. And we are here to make disciples, to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and to teach them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your love for all peoples, including those of us up here in Bemidji. Thank you for loving this world so much that you sent your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to pay the price for us, that our sins would not be counted against us, but that they could be taken care of by Jesus. Please help each one of us here today to grow more and more passionate about your gospel purposes for this world. And by your Spirit, please increase our burden for the spiritually lost. Increase our heart's desire to see them found. Give us a heart like yours of not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. We ask this together in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, Amen.